So uh, our subject is love your enemies. <clears throat> um, the last time I came to Frinton, I'd, I wasn't speaking. Um, and when I came in the, the door, somebody said, oh, we've got a good speaker today. <laughs> it wasn't you. No, you weren't the speaker. <laughs> um, and so when Paul said to me that the, the subject is love your enemies, and then in brackets, he said all of them. Uh, I wasn't quite sure if he just used poetic license and added all of them uh, to the subject or whether actually the subject was love all your enemies. And as I have been reading the, the passage um, or the passages that we've been thinking about or we're going to think about right now is I wasn't so sure about the concentration on the relationship between David um, uh, Jonathan and Saul, although we obviously will look at that. But there's clearly a warning um, that David was aware that in actual fact um, Saul was after him. And we read, oh, uh, not today, but we read how that the people had said, um, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And Saul probably was a little bit agitated about that. And therefore, you can see that in the, in the passage, uh, in the story, there is tension. There is tension between who thought they were more important uh, than the other. And Saul's plan was to have uh, David killed effectively. He wasn't probably going to do it himself. Um, but it was his intention that David would get caught in a situation because he was jealous of the position that David was uh, given. And yet Jonathan, come, uh, Jonathan comes to David, so Jonathan being his good friend, saying, don't worry, it's all going to be fine. Now, if we carry on reading or read previous, we actually read that Saul had 6,000 men with him. Now, I'm not just saying they were all out to get David, but he had a pretty big army. And Jonathan comes and says, David, it's all right, don't worry. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. I'm not sure how receptive I would have been in that situation, uh, that everything was going to be uh, fine. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. You'll be king over Israel, and I will be second to you. Even my father, Saul, knows this. So what we then go on to, to read is a story of how David and Saul came together. And I've got to say, there's little bits of this story I don't quite get. So what we read in verse uh, 3 is he came to the sheep pens, this is Saul, along the, way, um, along the way. A cave was there and Saul went in to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. How big was this cave? We're told that David had 600 men with him. Now, maybe they weren't all in the cave. But it seems a little bit of a funny twist to the story that Saul went into the mouth of the cave and couldn't hear or was aware, potentially, of another 600 men in the cave. I don't know how that strikes you, but when I was reading it, I thought, that seemed a little bit strange. And the men, this is David's men, said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. And Saul didn't hear that either. So his men are talking to him and saying, you know, this is the day that, that God has made, so to speak. And Saul still doesn't hear, he's completely oblivious. And then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. And afterwards, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. Why was he conscious stricken about cutting off a piece of his robe? Well, what was that about? He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. With these words, David sharply rebuked his men 
and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul still heard nothing. There is something that the story isn't telling us, in my view. And Saul left the cave and went his way. I'm not sure what I've highlighted actually matters. It was just as I was reading through it, it seemed to be a little bit of an anomaly because that isn't the point to the story and why we are considering it this morning. Saul hates David, or certainly was jealous of David. And therefore, for the purpose of today, was classified as his enemy. I'd like to go to the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, we read this. You've heard that it was said, eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, hand over your coat as well. If anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them two miles. And give to the one who asks you, and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, love your, en- love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Do any of you have any enemies? You've looked loads of enemies. I don't actually believe you, but <coughs> do you want to elaborate? No, thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> Would anybody classify that they would consider that they've got enemies? Okay, so there's... Right, good point, thank you. Thank you. What about, um, what about physical people that we know? Okay, let's take it a, a little, sort of take it down a notch to people we just don't really get along with. Nikki. <laughs> now I think we've, re- we've sort of broadened the category, haven't we? <clears throat> Is because there are people that we just kind of don't get along with, aren't there? And, and perhaps we don't go out of our way to love them. So let's, let's replace the word enemy with people we don't really get along with. And now we've broadened the challenge, haven't we? Because very much there's an attitude, I think, that uh, certainly for me, that, you know, I don't get on with you, but you live your separate life, I live my separate life, our paths don't cross, so hey-ho, if you're a nutter, you're a nutter, and it doesn't need to disturb me. (laughs) Just giving a random example. So when I went to university, I was 18, I met a man called Mark Berry, well, he was a boy then, Mark Berry, <clears throat> and uh, he, I went to university in London, and we were walking home one day, I can't remember, well, we lived close to each other, and he said to me, bear in mind he was 18, he said to me, God has put it on my heart that he's brought me here to this university uh, in order to lead the Christian Union for the next three years. And I thought to myself, you arrogant? I've forgotten the next word. (laughs) And I thought, I don't like you. And I thought, but our paths aren't necessarily going to cross. So you can carry on. Well, of course, if he was right, that there was a prophecy that God had brought him to lead the university's Christian union, then potentially that could be a problem later on. Uh, But I didn't think about that then. So I thought, Mark, you go your separate way, and I'll make sure that when I'm leaving university, Uh, to walk home at night, you're not leaving at the same time. A year later, his prophecy came true, and he was the president or or chairman or whatever of the Christian Union at the university, and I was the book sec. And so suddenly we were on a committee together, and I thought, this isn't isn't really good now, because um, I don't like you. Uh, I'm sure you like me, but I don't really like you. and we're served on this committee together. So one day I invited him round to our house, my house, my flat. 
and, I, and, I, and we had some food, and I said to him, Mark, I said, the reason I've invited you round is because I find you uh, arrogant and self-opinionated. <laughs> And, and I really feel that um, a year ago that was fine, but now we've got to confront that problem. And so he said to me, well, Grant, it's funny you should say that because I find you arrogant and self opinion Me arrogant. I mean, who could ever accuse me of being arrogant? <coughs> My point being is that where I thought that our paths could go in two separate directions, when we brought them together, we realised that actually we had to do something about it. And had we never talked about it, we would have never realised the challenge that perhaps was going on with both of us. And as a consequence of that evening, I think it would be a bit dramatic to say we became best friends, uh, but we certainly became friends. And so often, I think, when there is a difference between people, perhaps in this church, perhaps in your family, uh, perhaps in your neighbourhood, it's because we don't talk it through. And by us talking it through, we formed a friendship that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Uh, a few years ago, uh, some of you are aware of this story, um, I work in Kenya and I was accused of uh, corruption. I was on the board of a university and there were some people there that um, decided to accuse me uh, of doing things underhand and basically stealing money from the university. My son was actually at the same university, this is in Kenya, and he used to get the WhatsApp messages which are going around the students about what was taking place amongst these corrupt people at the top of the university. One of them was uh, Smith has confessed uh, that he stole the money and has given it back. Uh, another one was that him and Washira, Washira was the VC of the university, have built some apartments uh, out of the proceeds that they've made uh, from their stealing. And Sam's reply to that one was, OK, let's go and see the apartments. And of course, the trail went dead. I have got to say to you that this was about three or four years ago. It was the worst experience of my life. And the reason it was the worst experience of my life was twofold. One was I never thought anybody would ever accuse me of corruption because we've always stood uh, in business and in a charity that we've never bribed, we've never authorised a bribe, and possibly more significantly, I've never been offered one. But two was the damage that it could do to Hand in Hand. That if people thought, oh, Smith, who's the, the chair of Hand in Hand, is corrupt, so where's our money going? Is it going to build apartments in, in Kenya? <laughs> and that really, that really hurt, that the reputation that other people would hear about me would damage the financial contributions that are made to Hand in Hand, which ultimately damages the number of children that we can support. Because I've never been paid from Hand in Hand. I was... Uh, I was the ch a voluntary chair. I've never taken expenses or been paid from hand in hand. But I knew that as the chair, that reputation, if it got out that I was corrupt, could impact hand in hand. So, go forward about 18 months. Oh, I was actually interviewed by some forensic investigators. And, and the worst part of this story was that at the end of that investigation, I, had, I came to the conclusion, you're not going to find me innocent. I could tell by the way they were asking their questions that they'd already made up their mind. And I'm smiling now, but it wasn't funny then. But eventually they did find me innocent. And it came to graduation day, and the first person gets up on the podium to speak. So when I say graduation day, it's my son's graduation. The first person gets up on the podium to speak, and, I'm th and, and, he's, and he does his speech, and then everybody applauds. And I'm thinking, I can't applaud you. I know what you've done behind the scenes which impacted me. So everybody's clapping and I'm... The next person gets up on the, the podium to speak and they give their speech and it comes to the point where everybody applauds. I think, oh, I can't applaud you either. I know, I know the motive of what you did in order to do, 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 do. Five people got up on the podium and I couldn't applaud any of them. I had my very good reasons for not applauding any of them. And after the graduation, uh, my son, 
um, was going back to one of his lecturers for a cup of tea and cake, and we were invited back to go to this lecturer's house. And we went into his lounge, and Sam, uh, and there's a few things said, and somebody said, Sam, would you like to say anything? Let's call the other person Ted. He said, Ted was extremely racist uh, during the time when my dad was being accused of corruption. But today in the graduation, I was able to hug him and truly, from my heart, forgave him. And as I listened to my son, see, parents are meant to give the guidance to their children. <laughs> We don't get lessons from our children. We do, the parents do the lesson teaching, don't we? <clears throat> so as I listened to my son saying I was able to hu uh, hug Ted and forgive him, I'm thinking to myself, I clearly haven't forgiven anyone, have I? And I didn't realise that I hadn't forgiven anyone. I just, I just was avoiding the challenge. And at that point, I realised that my, my son had captured what it meant to love Jesus. And you see, the normal reaction to somebody not liking us or being horrible to us is retaliate. But if we know the spirit of Jesus in our lives, it should be different. Shouldn't it? And I'm not saying it's automatic. I'm not saying it just flows. You know, I've been a, I, 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 well, the, the, the description I give it is, I looked to attempt to become a disciple of Jesus Christ when I was 19. That's over 40 years ago. And I don't find this subject or this area easy. And it was highlighted for me as I sat there in the graduation, where... An hour previously, I didn't think I had, let's not call them enemies, but certainly that I wasn't bearing a grudge. And then I realised I was. I'm just telling you my story. I don't know your story. I'm sure you all have stories. If any of that resonates with you, all I would encourage you to do is whoever you feel attention with, whoever you feel perhaps as a grudge, it may be, in a sense, nothing to do with you. It's, it's, it's them holding a grudge against you. Go and talk to them. Go and demonstrate what Jesus would do if he was here. Because Jesus wouldn't allow that to carry on and so often fester and get worse and grow out of where it actually started. I can't particularly explain to you why I got accused of corruption. I think there were a couple of people in there who were highly driven, self-motivated uh, people that... Um, that felt that, that they were in the place that, that God wanted them to be, and I was challenging that. I don't know. They're not here. In one sense, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we shouldn't let the sun go down. If we are knowingly bearing a grudge or a grievance with somebody else, I'm the speaker, so you all listen to me. Tell a few funnies. Turn up late. My sister doesn't talk to me. I think I know why. But she's never actually said why. To be frank, I don't think our husband helps, but obviously I have to love them both. My sister. 
and she won't talk to me. Can you imagine anybody not wanting to talk to me? All I'm saying is that if Jesus, if living a life as a disciple of Jesus Christ, filled with the Spirit, means anything, it has to mean something in our challenging relationships. And I don't know the solution or the answer to my sister and I. I know it's wrong. And I'm not for a moment suggesting it's her problem, not mine. But this far in our lives, we haven't been able to solve it. And that's wrong. And so perhaps if I'm to finish today with a, a challenge, <coughs> it's to ask you to pray for me in the relationship with my sister. Her name's Sheila. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks that you are almighty God of creation. We give you thanks that for all the, I think it's said somewhere in the Bible, or the picture that is given where we run around like ants uh, with our own little challenges and the, our own um, things that go on in our lives that we need to solve. You are the God overall. And Father, today I believe uh, we have been inspired to hear Nikki and Donna's story and testimony. And mm. Father, we commit to you the challenging relationships in our lives. That Lord God, if accepting Jesus Christ as Saviour and knowing Christ in my life is to make any difference, one, one of the places for this difference is in those challenging relationships. And we commit them to you and ask Lord God for healing, for restoration, and for love to be demonstrated, and for us to have the relationships that you want us to have. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Stop working. Even when I don't see you working. 